Okay. Uh, so let us start with the URI UX introductory workshop. So this is the part two uh, of the UI UX workshop series. So part one has been conducted, I think, uh, one month ago from today. And Leslie was the presenter. In the workshop, we have gone through certain interesting concepts. So if you are still in the Slack channel, haven't left yet, you can go access the UX slides. Yeah. So these are the presenters for today. My name is Terence, and I'm a teaching assistant officially in SOC NUS. And Leslie here, he's a front-end developer for Envision Digital. As you can see, Leslie's uh, company portfolio is quite huge, whereas mine is only two. So I'm less experienced. But I'm just here to share regardless. Yeah, and um, just for everyone's info, right, we are the ones who create the slides. Yeah. So this is part two, user interface. And for part one, I would strongly encourage everyone to take a look at part one, see what we are talking about in part one before you revise or rather look through part two. Because part one is about understanding who are your users and how they behave. And that's really important for good user interaction design. Yeah, so we have to answer this question first before we can talk about this uh, particular workshop series. Right? Why is UI important? Let's say you're working in the dating industry like me previously. You realize that everything is very similar. All the functionalities, all the things that you show, right? Like age, name, uh, religion preferences, they are roughly the same. But what makes your app stand out is really the user interaction or the user interface itself. And without a good UI, you can't even compete with the big players out there because they have spent so much time and research on it. Yeah, so this is what I call an entry ticket. Without this ticket, you can't compete in the industry. And a good interface actually provides a good experience. And this is really important because nowadays, a lot of mobile applications especially, they lose a lot of users each month. This is simply because of um, unknown UI bugs or maybe the process of signing up is not good enough or maybe it's too clunky and people will just leave your platform without uh, any explanation. So if a good UI, you are going to retain the users and therefore your company can uh, survive longer. And uh, just like a side note, right, this workshop is not about creating beautiful art pieces. We are more, we are focusing on functional design. This means that it must work and it somehow looks nice and looks structured when the components are all pieced together. <coughs> So before we can talk about our web design or maybe mobile design, we have to understand how we perceive our environment. So this group of scientists, um, they're not named Gostop. All of them are not named Gostop, but this uh, Gostop is actually a group of uh, researchers. And what they have found out during the 19th century is that uh, we perceive things in a certain way or a certain manner. And uh, these concepts or these laws right, has been widely applied to architecture design, and definitely mobile and web design. And when we talk about laws, right, you think that, hey, we definitely have to follow the laws through and through. But uh, in my opinion, I think these laws are just like a bounce for our creativity. Because sometimes you feel that, hey, this might work out, then you go super out of the box, right? And then you realize that, hey, this is no longer functional. So I like to term Gestalt laws as like our bounce of creativity. Keep us uh, in a structure or keep us in line of what we want to achieve. Yeah, it's also a very good basis of your UI decision making uh, process. So uh, for this workshop, I'm just going to share with you guys the top three custom laws that appear everywhere in web and mobile design. So this is the first one. This is called figure ground. As you can see from this picture, right? Um, can anyone tell me what uh, do they see in this picture? So what do you see in the picture? Two faces? Yeah. Uh, does anyone see a cup? Yeah. So in this picture, you can uh, interpret it in two different ways. This is simply because of you focusing on one color, and then the other, uh, other color will become the background. Yeah. So whatever you're focusing on, we, we call it a figure. And whatever that you're not focusing on is the ground. 
Yeah, so this is another example. In this picture, you might see a lady or you might see a guy playing music. Yeah, so this is a very lengthy explanation. I'm just going to skip it. And this is very instinctive to us. This is like uh, immediately it happens to uh, our per perception. And how do we apply figure ground in web applications or even mobile applications? So this is a very strong, this is a very direct usage of it. When you have a pop-up, when you have a model that pops out straight away, uh, immediately you want your user to focus on this element, right? So this is very uh, commonsensical kind of uh, design. And this is a more subtle example where you have a lot of white space in this area. And a lot of white space in this area. And then, and then you have a lot of information uh, centered. This is to enforce your users to look at what you have in the center rather than your background. So you create your own background, so you have your own figure. And these are some other, this is not say a good example, let us take a look. <clears throat> so we might not be able to see the gray rectangles here, but the, red, the gray rectangles helps users to um, focus on the words in this list. Whereas for the one on the right, you realize that, hey, it's just black and white, and you might not know if it's a button or not, if you create it as a button, because people might think this is just a very simple list of um, menu items. Yeah, so the design on the right is not really clear, whereas the one on the left is not perfect, but it is much better. And this is the very last example of figure ground. Um, the two buttons here have a very subtle difference. The button on the left, it doesn't have like a pop-up effect, right? This is what we call box shadow in uh, web design. Whereas the button on the right, it has some sort of shadow underneath the button. And the button on the right is so-called more welcoming to be clicked on. And this gives, uh, gives users a stronger message that, hey, this is a button for you to click on. Uh, if you compare it with the button on the left. Yeah, so that's it for figure ground. There are lots of other examples, but this is the ones that we are going to cover today. The next Gestalt law is what we call similarity. And this is, yet again, a very uh, common sense kind of thing. It's all imbued in us. Right? When we look at this uh, matrix here, you realize that we will group up the white dots and we will group up the black dots separately. Yeah, so in this case, we have maybe six groups, six groups of dots. And uh, similarity is very easy to apply. When you look at like a, a web application like YouTube, right? It has been applied everywhere in the front page. So on the right, you can see the videos. Every video component looks the same as one another. And therefore, in our minds, we have grouped them up as a list. And then we also have a header. So, so this is not part of similarity, but we have a header to uh, give users more information as to what this video list represents. Yeah, the one on the left, these are just simply menu options. Yeah, and we group them up because they belong to the same category. And without even uh, creating these boxes, right, instinctively, we know that these menu items are together. Uh, same for this as well. But how do we apply the complementary of complement of similarity? So we can look at these two examples here. The ones on the red, we can see that the video components they look similar, and therefore we group them up together. But when we uh, scroll down and we look, hey, this looks really different from the other video components, right? And therefore we will have this uh, idea of maybe this video is small, it's different. It's different from the other video list. And it gives us like the illusion of focus where this is a more important video than the ones in the list. So this is how you created, uh, create a very subtle effect. And this is also another very subtle example of using similarity in the opposite manner. Yeah, this is Airbnb. You realize that these are the super host houses and they get more space. And therefore, they are very different from the ones that are more um, what you call it, ordinary. So hopefully, this is not very confusing. 
if you want to create a similarity effect, right, just make sure that all the components have equal spacing. If not, you can just uh, have fun with it. You can change the color, you can change the shape. And if it looks different, we will group them up differently. The, this is not the final Gestalt law we are going to cover. We have another one later, but this is called proximity. When things are bundled up in this manner and we have a space in the middle, we will tend to group the 12 dots on the left as one group and the 12 dots on the right as another group. Right? I think everyone sees what I'm seeing right now, right? Yeah. And the next concept is very uh, closely tied with proximity. It is called connectedness. So when I um, create artificial visual tools for you to group them up, right, you realize that you will instinctively group up these four dots because I have a square here. And you will think that, hey, this belongs to one group. And you can actually connect the dots together and you have the... It's not an illusion, it's just a perception of these three dots being in the same group. And the other dots are just like maybe other things that we don't have to pay attention to. Before we talk about applying connectedness, right? Proximity is really simple to apply. Just make sure you have enough white space between components, right? And then you apply proximity already. Yeah, so if things are not going to belong in the same group, make sure you have enough space. And this is just like a very uh, rough guideline as to how much spacing you need. So if let's say uh, this particular line, let me turn my mouse closer. Let's say this particular line is around 8 pixels. The space must be at least 24 pixels apart. Then you have that proximity effect. For connectedness, I guess if you shop a lot on e-commerce sites, right, this is something that we see often in the payment system. right? When we are going to pay for something, we see the process of the payment. Fill up registration form. Uh, go to payment site. And then we have like a success at the end, right? So this is this is one way to apply connectedness, and this is like a very common way uh, to guide your users through something that is very complicated, like a user onboarding form, or like a yeah, sign up forms in general. You realize that if you don't follow any Gestalt laws, your design is probably going to look like this all over the place, and you have components of different shapes and sizes, and everything looks very confusing on your site. And this is not really good. Yeah. So all of these guidelines, right, I say again, a lot of uh, design professors will kill me, but I just say that this serves as a basis of your design. You don't have to follow the law uh, rule by rule and line by line. You just have to use it correctly and use it as like a bounce of your creativity. And what I have here on the screen is actually other Gestalt laws that you might be interested in. But the ones that I've gone through right is very relevant for web and mobile design. So next, <clears throat> let's talk about colors. For colors, I think everyone know what RGB is, right? It's red, green, and blue. And if you have Google RGB before, you should have seen like a Google image of the color space. It should look like a slanted triangle and red, blue, and green are very far away from one another. They are the extreme ends of the spectrum. But this is another color concept we have to talk about if you want to create a web or mobile design. So this is hue, saturation, and value. If you are taking like a games or media focus on school of computing, right? this is something you have to see a lot, especially in computer vision and uh, image processing kind of modules. <coughs> so hue basically means the base pigment. Remember the color space that I talked about? Hue actually represents the coordinate in the color space. Yeah. So if a color were to be very far away from the color space, let's say point A and point B is very far away, we can see that they have a very different hue. Yeah. And vice versa. If they are very close, means they are quite similar. Uh, for saturation, this is like the intensity, right? The intensity is actually not a very good word to describe this, but uh, pigment depth is pigment depth is the correct word to describe this. Basically, means how uh, the how is how how the color is, yeah. And value, 
simply means the opacity of it, right? Uh, it means if it's light or if it's dark. So these are the three uh, things that you, you have to learn today for colors. And how are they applied? This is a very direct application of hue, saturation, and value. So for hue, you can create contrast. If you pick a color very far, pick two colors very far away from each other in a space, right? You create a very good contrast. But is it nice or not? It really depends on your own perception. If this color appears to you a lot, means it's nice, and vice versa. For saturation, right? This is, I'm not sure. Ah, you can see. For saturation, this is like a very direct application of it. For buttons, if you want to let your users know that this can be clicked, right? When you hover over, or I think for mobile apps, when you uh, press on the button, it should change color as well. That one, you guys have to correct me about it if you are reading a lot of uh, material design guidelines. But then for web design, this is a direct application. Hover over a button, if it darkens, mean this, uh, means this object can be clicked. Or rather, you want your users to click on this object. For value, value has a very subtle application. Uh, this is another example of Airbnb. How they use uh, value is on their housing listing, right? They want their users to focus actually on the title itself. Uh, maybe the title is a very attractive title and users are more prone to visit this uh, house. And you realize the pricing, right, which is a sensitive issue, is not say very strongly highlighted. Even though the color is the same in terms of the RGB value, but the opacity is set in a different uh, weightage. So this may be opacity 50%, whereas the title right is opacity maybe 87 or 100%. Yeah, so this is how you hide, not say purposefully hide something, but the non-important information, you tend to show it, but you don't show it as loudly as the important information. Yeah, so these are very direct applications. <clears throat> and this is the 60, 30, 10 rule. If you are lost, right, if you don't know how to use colors, this is a very hard and fast rule you can apply and it will work for most of the web or mobile applications out there. So this is one very good example of a 60, 30, 10 concept where you can see white consists of 60%. <clears throat> Remember that this are also shades of white. It's just that the value is different. Yeah? Or rather the saturation is different. Sorry, even I get mixed up. The saturation is different. Yeah, but the <clears throat> but the value, I mean the color value is still the same. And if you are lost, uh, you don't know how to pick a complementary color, this can be a very good guide for you. Um, high contrast colors, we have a list here, and low contrast colors, we also have a list here. And if you are still very lost with colors, right, you can be like me, you know, when I was uh, like asked to design a landing page suddenly. I have to find my own colors to use, right? So these are two very good sites you can click on and see how they can help you pick a color scheme. Yeah, so a color scheme can be useful because uh, uh, first and foremost, you've got five colors to look at. And if you like really like these five colors, you can just apply it anywhere on your site already. So this is like a no-brainer. Just click, click until you get the color you like and go for it. And this is like a consequence of not following the color space theory, or rather, not following any color guidelines. And this is something very interesting to touch on, color blindness. So if your app would be, in fact, most apps must be used for, uh, designed for everyone, right? So if you're very OCD and you want to account for color blindness, go ahead and look at more color blindness concepts so that your color, the colors you pick right can be um, seen by everyone. <clears throat> and I don't want to go through this in depth. This is somewhat like a pseudoscience. This hasn't been proven much, but uh, generally this is like a soft guideline. Yeah, if you're creating like a wellness app, I think wellness app usually now is green or very light blue, right? It's like a very uh, chill kind of vibe. Whereas if you are like Airbnb or you like a dating site, you would like to use pink and red more. Yeah, because it represents passion or something. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Now this one I've gone through slightly just now. Yeah, but this is a very uh, 
tough side to solo, so you can look at it uh, when you have more time and you're interested in this. Yeah, achieving different color variations. So let me go through some examples of color usage. From this site alone, you realize that, hey, everything is very dark, right? Yeah, I agree with you, but at least they have some contrast that's being achieved here. They use this um, color code of purple, and they use this color code of gray. And just now you realize we talked about colors of high contrast. You remember um, purple and yellow, right? Even though they have high contrast, but they don't necessarily work together very well in the same uh, web page. Yeah, so there's something you have to take note. You have to create enough contrast and yet still look very uh, aesthetically pleasing right? for most mobile sites and for most web designs out there. And um, you realize I somewhat violated the 60, 30, 10 rule, right? My 10 isn't one color. My 10 is a lot of other colors. As you can see from <clears throat> the text here and other elements, so that 10%, it is really up to you to pick one or multiple colors. But just have two primary colors, and I think your site should look okay. Now, so this is obviously a bad example. So firstly, everything is very bright here. For some context, right, this is a company selling juice. So in the US, they have like a school lunch, right? And then they are a company that provides the juice packet for that school lunch. <clears throat> Okay, I get it, right? Because they want to appeal to kids. But you have to think about it. Are kids really going to buy the juice or are the schools buying the juice, right? So this is some uh, UX misapplication. But anyways, let's talk about the UI component of it. These are ice cream colors, right? I, I don't oppose these colors, but I don't think this works on this side. And you realize it's not following the 60, 30, 10 rule, and therefore it looks very awkward. We have a multitude of colors, right? We have red. We have red, and then we have green, we have yellow, so it's like a mess. So try to avoid this kind of situation on your uh, web applications or even your mobile applications. So that's it for colors. So is everyone still with me? Hopefully everything is easy to understand, but maybe we haven't gone through a lot of in-depth stuff, but it's okay. As long as everyone is going to understand everything, um, we have an easy time for the hands-on activity later. Yeah, so let's move on to typography. Typography simply means uh, the style of uh, your words in a website or the mobile app. And these are some basic terminologies. You might think that, hey, I should skip the terminologies, right? But uh, sadly, we cannot skip them because these are going to appear in your CSS or in your XML or whatever uh, spreadsheets or the style sheets that mobile applications use nowadays. So this kind of terminologies, if you know it, it's good. Because later on, once you know it, you know how to control certain things on your text. Yeah? <clears throat> I'm pretty sure word spacing, letter spacing, uh, CSS uh, classes or attributes you can use to tweak your words. Yeah. So it is good to know them. And this concept of alignment it is also good to know. Because how you align your text will really change the look of your mobile application especially. Yeah. So this is an example of a good website with good typography. You realize I talk about Airbnb a lot because I think they spend too much time on design, which is a good problem. Oh, these words are a bit small, I should enlarge it. So I didn't apply typography correctly. But anyways, I'm just going to read out what is on the slide. So uh, if you go to an Airbnb website on your laptop now, or on your mobile phone, you realize that the titles of the listing tends to stand out a lot more than the other information. This is because uh, usually the title attracts people whether they want to book a house or not, and also the picture. But for the sake of typography, let's talk about the title instead. And you realize that we have this very large word in the picture, right? This also grabs your attention. And by doing this right, they don't have to create like a menu to tell you, hey, this section is for work, this section is for family. They somehow create a very pleasing, uh, eye pleasing way to create a menu button on the top. So this is still in a very good creativity bound, even though to some people they are not used to it, right? They will complain about it. But I think that it's still fine. <clears throat> 
Yeah, yet again, I repeat myself yet again, the title stands up. Yeah. For typography, this is the extent we are going to cover for today. The other concepts, I feel that it is too rushed to cover in this very uh, simple, very introductory kind of workshop. Yeah, so for other concepts on typography, I encourage you to read the resources later that I have. Yeah? But let's talk about something more important called the layout. Layout is something that I've noticed a lot of uh, orbital projects. This is something that we lack in a lot of orbital projects. Yeah, so if you're lost on how to put your components in your mobile app or in your website, right, this is a very good guideline to follow. Just use a grid system. And then you realize these grid systems, right, we are following a certain, uh, what do you call it? Certain number multiple. Right, for this case, we are following, I think, multiples of eight. So everything is uh, in the multiples of eight. Whereas this one, we are not that strict. But anyhow, uh, we have, all the components are designed such that they have a certain weightage of pixels. And then later on, once you place them in a screen, I think I have it on the next example. Oh, I don't have it. Okay. When we present them as on a screen, right, you realize your components will be placed and they will take up a certain space in this screen size. So this is something that everyone has to take note of. If your component is too big and it's unnecessarily big, right? It's very obvious. Right? Let's say your button is 100, 120 pixels. On the mobile phone, which is 320 times 568, right? You will just stand out like a soft thumb. Yeah, so these are some things to take note when you are creating your own uh, elements and de deciding how much pixels to assign to this button. Yeah. So let me jump back to the uh, previous slide. <coughs> so if you don't use a grid, this is most likely what you are going to show me during splashdown. Yeah? So this website doesn't follow a grid at all and it's very chaotic. <clears throat> I think my slides are misplaced. I'm so sorry. Okay, never mind. But if you are still very confused about the grid concept, right? I mean like how to start, right? You can follow material design guidelines from Google. So in this website, I think they have all the kinds of uh, advice for you, right? It will just say, uh, maybe page titles, you have this certain sizing, and then you're good to go. Yeah, you can always Google material uh, design by Google, and then you will get all of these pixel recommendations. So these are some of the few that we have picked up for you guys to see. Yeah, and screen size, right? Usually it's in the power of it, it's multiples of it. And therefore Google recommends eight pixel spacing. And this is what we also recommend for you guys. Eight pixel is like the magic number. Uh, previously in my internship in the US, we used five pixels for mobile phones. I didn't ask the designer why, but you can use five multiples of five also if you guys are more comfortable with that. Yeah. So this is, well, this is supposed to happen after the material design slides. Yeah, so this is an example of material design. I guess a lot of you guys use uh, Google Drive, right? And we see this every day. But we take this kind of design for granted. In fact, before Google Drive, I don't think we had this kind of very fanciful card design. Yeah, so this is a very good design to follow if you are creating a very similar site as Google Drive or like YouTube or maybe other social media uh, sites out there. So this is just a link for you guys to access later. Before we move on, right, you have to talk about different screen sizes because I showed you guys a slide of different screen sizes, right? And we have to learn how to cope with them. So let me digress a bit from the UI side of things to the front end development side of things. Right, uh, if you guys are still not familiar with media queries in CSS, right, for those of you guys who are designing a web application, it is time to research about it. So in media queries, right, you can actually put your CSS elements in this uh, CSS tag. <clears throat> and when the screen size changes to this particular pixels that are stated, you will actually follow another, follow that, uh, whatever CSS you have stated in this CSS tag. So this is something very useful. And this one, 
this thing, right, it should be done at this stage, I think. Because by now, I think all of, the, all of the functionalities in your application should be ready for usage, right? It's a very good time to start to think about these kind of things. What if my user were to use my website on a mobile phone? What is going to happen? How is my site going to look like on a mobile phone? After you think about that, you can actually implement um, all of your ideas onto something that's very similar to this. If you're using SCSS, like you're using a React package, right? SCSS is another way of doing it. Yeah, but everything you can Google for it. But this is just a very brief introduction for you guys to know that, hey, you can actually control how your site looks like at different screen pixel uh, dimensions. Oh, I didn't add animation for this. Oh, it's fine. So now let's look at the first um, change that Google did for YouTube. So when you realize you string your YouTube uh, website onto a mobile phone, right? You realize the sidebar turns into this menu, or what we call the hamburger. Yeah, we have three lines. So this is what we call the hamburger. So all of the elements in the sidebar get shifted inside here. And you realize the number of videos shown on your mobile phone, right, actually shrinks from four to three. Some people might want to give videos more space, they will just shrink it to two. And the very um, clean thing about this design is that the white space is maintained. Yeah, so you realize even though my dimension of my screen size shrink, on my website it still looks neat. And therefore we have this, uh, rule of thumb for everyone to follow. So when you are creating a mobile web application design, right, make sure when you shrink down everything, there's still enough white space between your components. This is very important. And if you are having, you have a horizontal or vertical list, right, make sure you are going to reduce the size of the elements, the, the size of the items inside, and adjust them to fit. Make sure they are still uh, going to look nice even though you shrink it down. And then for the unnecessary information, like the good to have things, right, you can just shift it to a navigation bar. How you do it, you can get creative, uh, you can get creative with it. Yeah, just like a very, this third guideline, right, is just like a very loose one. For those of you guys who are creating mobile applications, I think that nowadays there's tons of uh, help out there. Last time when I was coding in Android Studios, I don't have this flexible layout scheme for me to place my components. I think I, once I place it, I still have to code it to a certain dimension. That's what I remember. But right now, the new Android Studios, you are able to uh, place your components and you are able to select the flexible option. For iOS, I think all along you can do it already. So mobile applications have this inbuilt kind of uh, screen dimension control for you. Whereas for React Native, uh, there's this concept called Flexbox you can use also. For those who are using React Native, I'm pretty sure you're quite familiar with it. <laughs> yeah, but for some mobile app design rule of thumb, right? Yeah, yet again, you, uh, you need to make sure all your pickables are spread out and large enough. Because on a mobile phone, if your buttons are too small, right, you realize your, if your users have a fat finger like me, it's really, really hard to click on that button. So I forgot to include it. I forget to include that particular small side note, but the recommended button size right, is 48 by 48 pixels. Yeah, so take note of that. The second guideline, um, something to do with scroll view. So some of my students, they like to abuse scroll view too much, then they just dump everything into it. So you realize you scroll, like you scroll 10 times, you still see new content. So this is something that everyone needs to avoid in this room, because if your scroll view is too long, right, usually users will just swipe three times and they expect your app to show them everything in its entirety already. Yeah, so don't abuse scroll view too much. And for navigation bar guidelines, right, uh, so this is one example of a navigation bar. For this navigation bar, I encourage everyone to pick icons that can uh, present enough information such that the user know when he clicks on this icon, right, where he will expect himself to go to. 
Yeah, so I see some students, they include words with icons and left, left bar doesn't have the space to include words. Yeah, so the only occasion where I will encourage words with icons is when you have less than four items. Then I think you have the space to do it. Else you can just dig out some icons on Font Awesome or maybe Flat, flat Icon and you can solve this problem here. Oh, well, seems like we are getting to the fun part. Yeah, so after talking about all the concepts here, right, you realize that, hey, this guy is just telling me all the concepts, but how to apply it? Maybe this guy also don't know. But let, let, let's see whether this guy knows or not. Yeah, so I think we should extend the hands-on activity timing to a much longer time. So with all of these concepts, right, we talk about the style laws, colors, typography, layout. It is time to apply it. So can everyone access this URL first? tiny.cc slash orbital style guide. So once you access this URL, you should see what I'm seeing on my screen here. So this disclaimer is just for you guys to read. Um, I'm using this term called style guide very loosely. In fact, this is just a very design-centric uh, style guide. Because if you were to talk about style guides in the industry, this is what you should expect. Uh, it involves branding, it involves like the company vision and all those. Yeah, let us just click on a very, I think, lonely planet. Oh, not this. So this is what we call a very comprehensive design branding style guide. We have all the tags and all the kind of visions they, they have in their site. And they talk about a lot of very highly detailed, confusing things. But in our Orbital Workshop Style Guide, we talk about the things that are very, very important. So the first section, color scheme. You have to pick your main colors first before you can uh, decide how to create your components on a, maybe a hi-fi prototyping website. So colors are important. These are also very important. Your button colors, your other colors to consider, right? You can pick them out later on with the tool that I'm going to recommend. And typography, it is good to tell. Oh, by the way, right? You create a style guide, not for yourself only. I will assume that both you and your partner is going to be involved in the design process. And therefore, if you have a standardized document, right? It is very easy for you guys to coordinate certain things. You can just uh, tell your partner or maybe tell yourself also to always share back with this style guide. Maybe your partner feels that this color is much more fanciful for your website, right? Maybe your partner can update here. And then when you are free and you want to get, uh, you want to start designing certain things, right? You can refer back to the style guide and see what your partner has come up with. And then later on, you can also add in your own ideas and hopefully when you guys create a design, right, you'll be coherent. Yeah, later on, I'm going to talk about this collaborative design tool. <clears throat> As for typography, right, it is good to test out your font in this way. Yeah, because if you don't, when you select a font and you only view it in 14 pixels, you can only get uh, one view of it. So once you select a font, it is good to conduct this exercise. Just create a lot of uh, different uh, just use the same font and then set different font sizes to see whether your font still looks nice when it's large or when it's small. Font width is also very important. That's why I said, right, the color concept of value. Font width will actually help you uh, enunciate that concept even more. So font width is this. You can see how... Um... Oh, I'm not scrolling. I'm so sorry. I'm not scrolling this one. So typography, as I was talking about, 
you can see how I have different sentences in different font sizes. And for font weights, we can see how they are different in terms of intensity. As for layout, right, I don't want to get very specific for layout. So this is the bare minimum I want to see in everyone's style sheet data. Uh, just choose like a multiple to follow. And if you have any very extra important components, right, you can just list it down here in this uh, layout section. And these are some things that I didn't cover in today's style guide. So, but they are equally important. So if you have an application logo, right, it is good to have it with different colors. So you know when you are picking the color on top, right, picking the color scheme. By right, it should match with the color uh, of your logo. Yeah. Animations, this is something that is very, very hard to represent on Google Drive. So I uh, don't... Animations, is, it appears in a lot of uh, style guides. Uh. So this is just a good to know. And the icons you are using. Uh, so this is also very important. <coughs> but don't get started yet, guys. I'm just going to briefly run through certain things that we are going to uh, talk about later. So we are going to talk about Figma also. So these are some useful resources. Uh, at the end of my presentation, I will actually send this slide over to the Slack channel so everyone can access this resource. And then later on, uh, we can create our own style guide straight away. Yeah, so I'm just going to take, uh, click on a few sites to let you guys see what it is about. So I clicked on flat UI colors. And this site actually helps you select your own color palette. You, there's a lot to choose from actually. So once you click on one, you decide on one, you can access all the colors here. Simply by just clicking the button, you get the color, uh, color uh, value. Yeah, and I'm not sure if you guys know about this, but this is called Font Awesome. So in this website, right, there's a lot of fonts that everyone can just use for their mobile applications or for their, we have to send an email. Now just send your email over and you should get a list of uh, very fanciful icons. Previously when I was using, I didn't need to send an email, but it's okay, maybe they expanded this. Yeah. So before we get started on a hands-on activity, I just want to end off the workshop slides. Uh, before we uh, get started on designing, make sure you know how much time you have left and how much effort is to do certain things. If you are able to create a very complicated calendar uh, user interface, right? you need to know what are the free ones out there to use because Android and iOS, or maybe for web applications, there's really a very comprehensive library out there that does the calendar things for you. Yeah, so there's no point to design something that has been done very beautifully by other people, right? When you can reuse it. So this is something very important to know also. And this, I think this section here, it doesn't talk about UI that much really. We talk about um, actual implementation, actual fun and development concepts. Yeah. yeah, for iOS, we have a very extensive uh, notification uh, selection for you guys to try already. So don't go and create your own notification UI. It's a waste of time. And these are the three questions you have to ask yourself. Since this is like July already, right? And Splashdown is coming up very soon. Do you still have the time to create a very extensive UI? Yeah, I, I don't want to influence people to like spend all their time on the prototyping tool and then spend all the time on front-end development. Then they told right, your things don't work. Your functionalities, your CRUD doesn't work. It doesn't make sense that way. Yeah? And uh, when you're creating your UI, right, it is good to let other people have an opinion on it. Well, I know as designers, we are very defensive about our own things, right? We think that this is the best. But then ultimately, it is other users that will determine whether our product is the best or not. Yeah, so after listening to feedback, right, it is always good to run through the style guide again, run through your prototype and see what parts you can change to suit the person's needs better. And then later on, you can decide whether you want to implement the changes or not. Yeah. So this is the things that we have learned today. Visual perception, these are some of the concepts we have gone through. Uh, real application of theories, I've shown quite a lot of examples, right, of the do's and don'ts. Hopefully everyone can 
understand it clearly. And these are some of the advice that we have talked about. Yeah, so let us jump to the hands-on workshop component. Let me set out the slides first and then uh, we can get started on it. 